Chapter Fifty One of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Fifty One. Affording an explanation of more mysteries than one, and comprehending a proposal of marriage with no word of settlement or pin money. The events narrated in the last chapter were yet but two days old when Oliver found himself, at three o'clock in the afternoon, in a travelling carriage rolling fast towards his native town. Mrs. Maylie, and Rose, and Mrs. Bedwin, and the good doctor were with him, and Mr. Brownlow followed in a post-chaise, accompanied by one other person, whose name had not been mentioned. They had not talked much upon the way, for Oliver was in a flutter of agitation and uncertainty, which deprived him of the power of collecting his thoughts, and almost of speech, and appeared to have scarcely less effect on his companions, who shared it in at least an equal degree. He and the two ladies had been very carefully made acquainted by Mr. Brownlow, with the nature of the admissions which had been forced from monks, and although they knew that the object of their present journey was to complete the work which had been so well begun, still the whole matter was enveloped in enough of doubt and mystery to leave them in endurance of the most intense suspense. The same kind friend had, with Mr. Losburn's assistance, cautiously stopped all channels of communication through which they could receive intelligence of the dreadful occurrences that had so recently taken place. It was quite true, he said, that they must know them before long, but it might be at a better time than the present, and it could not be at a worse. So they travelled on in silence, each busied with reflections on the object which had brought them together, and no one disposed to give utterance to the thoughts which crowded upon all. But if Oliver, under these influences, had remained silent while they journeyed towards his birthplace, by a road he had never seen, how the whole current of his recollections ran back to old times, and what a crowd of emotions were wakened up in his breast when they turned into that which he had traversed on foot, a poor houseless, wandering boy, without a friend to help him, or a roof to shelter his head. "'See there! there!' cried Oliver, eagerly clasping the hand of Rose, and pointing out at the carriage window. "'That's the stile I came over. There are the hedges I crept behind, for fear anyone should overtake me and force me back. Yonder is the path across the fields, leading to the old house where I was a little child.' "'Oh, Dick, Dick, my dear old friend, if I could only see you now!' "'You will see him soon,' replied Rose, gently taking his folded hands between her own. "'You shall tell him how happy you are, and how rich you have grown, and that in all your happiness you have none so great as the coming back to make him happy too.' "'Yes, yes!' said Oliver, and we'll, we'll take him away from here, and have him clothed and taught, and send him to some quiet country place where he may grow strong and well, shall we?" Rose nodded. Yes, for the boy was smiling through such happy tears that she could not speak. "'You will be kind and good to him, for you are to every one,' said Oliver. "'It will make you cry, I know, to hear what he can tell. But never mind, never mind. It will be all over, and you will smile again. I know that, too, to think how changed he is. You did the same with me. He said, God bless you, to me, when I ran away, cried the boy with a burst of affectionate emotion, and I will say, God bless you now, and show him how I love him for it. As they approached the town, and at length drove through its narrow streets, it became matter of no small difficulty to restrain the boy within reasonable bounds. There were sourberries, the undertakers, just as it used to be, only smaller and less imposing in appearance than he remembered it. There were all the well-known shops and houses, with almost every one of which he had some slight incident connected. There was Gamfield's cart, the very cart he used to have, standing at the old public-house door. There was a workhouse, the dreary prison of his youthful days with its dismal windows frowning on the street. There was the same lean porter, standing at the gate, at sight of whom Oliver involuntarily shrunk back, and then laughed at himself for being so foolish, then cried, then laughed again. 
There were scores of faces at the doors and windows that he knew quite well. There was nearly everything, as if he had left it but yesterday, and all his recent life had been but a happy dream. But it was pure, earnest, joyful reality. They drove straight to the door of the chief hotel, which Oliver used to stare up at with awe and think a mighty palace, but which had somehow fallen off in grandeur and size. And here was Mr. Grimwig, all ready to receive them, kissing the young lady, and the old one too, when they got out of the coach, as if he were the grandfather of the whole party, all smiles and kindness, and not offering to eat his head. No, not once. Not even when he contradicted a very old post-boy about the nearest road to London, and maintained he knew it best, though he had only come that way once, and that time fast asleep. There was dinner prepared, and there were bedrooms ready, and everything was arranged as if by magic. Notwithstanding all this, when the hurry of the first half-hour was over, the same silence and constraint prevailed that had marked their journey down. Mr. Brownlow did not join them at dinner, but remained in a separate room. The two other gentlemen hurried in and out with anxious faces, and, during the short intervals when they were present, conversed apart. Once Mrs. Maylie was called away, and after being absent for nearly an hour, returned with eyes swollen with weeping. All these things made Rose and Oliver, who were not in any new secrets, nervous and uncomfortable. They sat wondering in silence, or, if they exchanged a few words, spoke in whispers, as if they were afraid to hear the sound of their own voices. At length, when nine o'clock had come, and they began to think they were to hear no more that night, Mr. Losburn and Mr. Grimwig entered the room, followed by Mr. Brownlow, and a man whom Oliver almost shrieked with surprise to see for they told him it was his brother, and it was the same man he had met at the market-town, and seen looking in with Fagin at the window of his little room. Monks cast a look of hate, which even then he could not dissemble at the astonished boy, and sat down near the door. Mr. Brownlow, who had papers in his hand, walked to a table near which Rose and Oliver were seated. "'This is a painful task,' said he, but these declarations, which have been signed in London before many gentlemen, must be in substance repeated here. I would have spared you the degradation, but we must hear them from your own lips before we part, and you know why." "'Go on,' said the person addressed, turning away his face. "'Quick! I have almost done enough, I think. Don't keep me here.' "'This child,' said Mr. Brownlow drawing Oliver to him, and laying his hand upon his head, is your half-brother, the illegitimate son of your father, my dear friend Edwin Leaford, by poor young Agnes Fleming, who died in giving him birth." "'Yes,' said Monks, scowling at the trembling boy, the beating of whose heart he might have heard, "'that is the bastard child!' "'The term you use—' said Mr. Brownlow sternly, is a reproach to those long since past beyond the feeble censure of the world. It reflects disgrace on no one living, except you who use it. Let that pass. He was born in this town." "'In the workhouse of this town,' was the sullen reply. "'You have the story there?' He pointed impatiently to the papers as he spoke. "'I must have it here, too,' said Mr. Brownlow looking round upon the listeners. "'Listen, then, you,' returned Monks. "'His father, being taken ill at Rome, was joined by his wife, my mother, from whom he had been long separated, who went from Paris and took me with her to look after his property, for what I know, for she had no great affection for him, nor he for her. He knew nothing of us, for his senses were gone, and he slumbered on till next day when he died. Among the papers in his desk were two, dated on the night his illness first came on, directed to yourself. He addressed himself to Mr. Brownlow, and enclosed in a few short lines to you, with an intimation on the cover of the package that it was not to be forwarded till after he was dead. One of these papers was a letter to this girl Agnes, the other a will. What of the letter? asked Mr. Brownlow. The letter? A sheet of paper crossed and crossed again with a penitent confession and prayers to God to help her. He had palmed a tale on the girl that some secret mystery, to be explained one day, 
prevented his marriage to her just then, and so she had gone on, trusting patiently to him, until she trusted too far, and lost what none could ever give her back. She was, at that time, within a few months of her confinement. He told her all he had meant to do, to hide her shame, if he had lived, and prayed her, if he died, not to curse his memory, or think the consequences of their sin would be visited on her, or their young child, for all the guilt was his. He reminded her of the day he had given her the little locket, and the ring, with a Christian name engraved upon it, and a blank left for that, which he hoped one day to have bestowed upon her, prayed her yet to keep it, and wear it next to her heart, as she had done before, and then ran on wildly in the same words over and over again, as if he had gone distracted. I believe he had. "'The will,' said Mr. Brownlow, as Oliver's tears fell fast. Monks was silent. "'The will,' said Mr. Brownlow, speaking for him, was in the same spirit as the letter. He talked of miseries which his wife had brought upon him, of the rebellious disposition, vice, malice, and premature bad passions of you, his only son, who had been trained to hate him, and left you and your mother each an annuity of eight hundred pounds. The bulk of his property he divided into two equal portions, one for Agnes Fleming, and the other for their child, if it should be born alive, and ever come of age. If it were a girl, it was to inherit the money unconditionally, but, if a boy, only on the stipulation that in his minority he should never have stained his name with any public act of dishonour, meanness, cowardice, or wrong. He did this, he said, to mark his confidence in the other, and his conviction— only strengthened by approaching death, that the child would share her gentle heart and noble nature. If he were disappointed in this expectation, then the money was to come to you, for then, and not till then, when both children were equal, would he recognise your prior claim upon his purse, who had none upon his heart, but had, from an infant, repulsed him with coldness and aversion. "'My mother,' said Monks, in a louder tone, "'did what a woman should have done. She burnt this will. The letter never reached its destination, but that and the other proofs she kept, in case they ever tried to lie away the blot. The girl's father had the truth from her, with every aggravation that her, her violent hate. I love her for it, now, could add. Goaded by shame and dishonour, he fled with his children into a remote corner of Wales, changing his very name that his friends might never know of his retreat. And here, no great while afterwards, he was found dead in his bed. The girl had left her home in secret some weeks before. He had searched for her, on foot, in every town and village near. It was on the night when he returned home, assured that she had destroyed herself to hide her shame and his, that his old heart broke. There was a short silence here until Mr. Brownlow took up the thread of the narrative. "'Years after this,' he said, "'this man's, Edward Leeford's, mother came to me. He had left her when only eighteen, robbed her of her jewels and money, gambled, squandered, forged, and fled to London, where for two years he had associated with the lowest outcasts. She was sinking under a painful and incurable disease, and wished to recover him before she died. Inquiries were set on foot, and strict searches made. They were unavailing for a long time, but ultimately successful, and he went back with her to France. "'There she died,' said Monks, after a lingering illness, and on her deathbed she bequeathed these secrets to me, together with her unquenchable and deadly hatred of all whom they involved, though she need not have left me that for I had inherited long before. She would not believe that the girl had destroyed herself, and the child too, but was filled with the impression that a male child had been born, and was alive. I swore to her, if ever it crossed my path, to hunt it down, never to let it rest, to pursue it with the bitterest and most unrelenting animosity, to vent upon it the hatred that I deeply felt, and to spit upon the empty vaunt of that insulting will, by dragging it, if I could, to the very gallows foot. She was right. He came in my way at last. I began well. 
and but for babbling drabs, I would have finished as I began. As the villain folded his arms tight together, and muttered curses on himself in the impotence of baffled malice, Mr. Brownlow turned to the terrified group beside him, and explained that the Jew, who had been his old accomplice and confidant, had a large reward for keeping Oliver ensnared, of which some part was to be given up in the event of his being rescued, and that a dispute on his head had led to their visit to the country house for the purpose of identifying him. "'The locket and ring?' said Mr. Brownlow, turning to Monks. "'I bought them from the man and woman I told you of, who stole them from the nurse, who stole them from the corpse,' answered Monks, without raising his eyes. "'You know what became of them.' Mr. Brownlow merely nodded to Mr. Grimwig, who, disappearing with great alacrity, shortly returned, pushing in Mrs. Bumble, and dragging her unwilling consort after him. "'Do my eyes deceive me?' cried Mr. Bumble, with ill-feigned enthusiasm. "'Or is that little Oliver? Oh, Oliver, if you knowed how I've been a-grieving for you—' "'Hold your tongue, fool!' murmured Mrs. Bumble. "'Isn't nature nature, Mrs. Bumble?' remonstrated the workhouse master. "'Can't I be supposed to feel I, I has brought him up parochially, when I see him a-settin' here among ladies and gentlemen of the very affablest description? I always loved that boy as if he'd been my—my—my my, my own grandfather,' said Mr. Bumble halting for an appropriate comparison. "'Master Oliver, my dear, you remember the blessed gentleman in the white waistcoat? Ah, he went to heaven last week in a oak coffin with plate handles, Oliver.' "'Come, sir,' said Mr. Grimwig tartly, "'suppress your feelings.' "'I will do my endeavours, sir,' replied Mr. Bumble. "'How do you do, sir? I hope you are very well.' This salutation was addressed to Mr. Brownlow, who had stepped up to within a short distance of the respectable couple. He inquired, as he pointed to Monks, "'Do you know that person?' "'No,' replied Mrs. Bumble flatly. "'Perhaps you don't,' said Mr. Brownlow, addressing her spouse. "'I never saw him in all my life,' said Mr. Bumble. "'Nor sold him anything, perhaps?' "'No,' replied Mrs. Bumble. "'You never had, perhaps, a certain gold locket and ring?' said Mr. Brownlow. "'Certainly not,' replied the matron. "'Why are we brought here to answer to such nonsense as this?' Again Mr. Brownlow nodded to Mr. Grimwig, and again that gentleman limped away with extraordinary readiness. But not again did he return with the stout man and wife, for this time he led in two palsied women, who shook and tottered as they walked. "'You shut the door, then I told Sally died,' said the foremost one, raising her shrivelled hand. "'But you couldn't shut out the sound, nor stop the chinks.' "'No, no,' said the other, looking round her, and wagging her toothless jaws. "'No, no, no. We heard her try to tell you what she done, and saw you take a paper from her hand, and watched you too next day to the pawnbroker's shop," said the first. Yes, added the second, and it was a locket and gold ring. We found out that, and saw it given you. We were by, oh, we were by. "'And we know more than that,' resumed the first, "'for she told us often, long ago, "'that the young mother had told her that, "'feeling she should never get over it. "'She was on her way, at the time that she was taken ill, "'to die near the grave of the father of the child.' "'Would you like to see the pawnbroker himself?' asked Mr. Grimwig, with a motion towards the door. "'No,' replied the woman. "'If he,' she pointed to Monks, "'has been coward enough to confess, as I see he has, 
and you have sounded all these hags till you have found the right ones. I've nothing more to say. I did sell them, and they're where you'll never get them. What then? Nothing, replied Mr. Brownlow, except that it remains for us to take care that neither of you is employed in a situation of trust again. You may leave the room. I hope— said Mr. Bumble, looking about him with great ruefulness, as Mr. Grimwig disappeared with the two old women. "'I hope that this unfortunate little circumstance will not deprive me of my parochial office.' "'Indeed it will,' replied Mr. Brownlow. "'You may make up your mind to that, and think yourself well off besides.' "'It was all Mrs. Bumble. She would do it,' urged Mr. Bumble first looking round to ascertain that his partner had left the room. "'That is no excuse,' replied Mr. Brownlow. "'You were present on the occasion of the destruction of these trinkets, and indeed are the more guilty of the two in the eye of the law, for the law supposes that your wife acts under your direction.' "'If the law supposes that,' said Mr. Bumble, squeezing his hat emphatically with both hands, "'the law is a ass. A idiot! If that's the eye of the law, the law is a bachelor, and the worst I wish the law is that his eye might be opened by experience. By experience!" Laying great stress on the repetition of these two words, Mr. Bumble fixed his hat on very tight, and putting his hands in his pockets, followed his helpmate downstairs. "'Young lady,' said Mr. Brownlow, turning to Rose, "'give me your hand. Do not tremble. You need not fear to hear the few remaining words we have to say. If they have, I do not know how they can, but if they have any reference to me, said Rose, pray let me hear them at some other time. I have not strength or spirits now. Nay, returned the old gentleman, drawing her arm through his, you have more fortitude than this, I am sure. "'Do you know this young lady, sir?' "'Yes,' replied Monks. "'I never saw you before,' said Rose faintly. "'I've seen you often,' returned Monks. "'The father of the unhappy Agnes had two daughters,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'What was the fate of the other, the child?' "'A child,' replied Monks. When her father died in a strange place, in a strange name, without a letter, book, or scrap of paper that yielded the faintest clue by which his friends or relatives could be traced, the child was taken by some wretched cottagers who reared it as their own. "'Go on,' said Mr. Brownlow, signing to Mrs. Maylie to approach. "'Go on.' "'You couldn't find the spot to which these people had repaired,' said Monks. "'But where friendship fails, hatred will often force away. My mother found it, after a year of cunning search. Aye, and found the child. She took it, did she? No. The people were poor, and began to sicken. At least the man did, of their fine humanity. So she left it with them, giving them a small present of money, which would not last long, and promised more, which she never meant to send. She didn't quite rely, however, on their discontent and poverty for the child's unhappiness but told the history of the sister's shame, with such alterations as suited her, bade them take good heed of the child, for she came of bad blood, and told them she was illegitimate, and she were to go wrong at one time or other. The circumstances countenanced all this. The people believed it, and there the child dragged on an existence miserable enough even to satisfy us, until a widow lady, residing then at Chester, saw the girl by chance, pitied her, and took her home. There was some cursed spell, I think, against us, for in spite of all our efforts, she remained there, and was happy. I lost sight of her, two or three years ago, and saw her no more until a few months back. Do you see her now? Yes, leaning on your arm. But not the less my niece, cried Mrs. Maylie, folding the fainting girl in her arms, not the less my dearest child. I would not lose her now for all the treasures of the world. My sweet companion, my own dear girl." "'The only friend I ever had,' 
cried Rose, clinging to her, the kindest, best of friends. My heart will burst. I cannot bear all this. You have borne more, and have been through all the best and gentlest creature that ever shed happiness on every one she knew, said Mrs. Maylie, embracing her tenderly. Come, come, my love. Remember who this is who waits to clasp you in his arms, poor child. See here. Look, look, my dear. Not aunt, cried Oliver, throwing his arms about her neck. I never call her aunt. Sister, my own dear sister, that's something taught my heart to love so dearly from the first. Rose, dear, darling Rose. Let the tears which fell, and the broken words which were exchanged in the long, close embrace between the orphans, be sacred. A father, sister, and mother were gained and lost in that one moment. Joy and grief were mingled in the cup, but there were no bitter tears, for even grief itself arose so softened and clothed in such sweet and tender recollections that it became a solemn pleasure and lost all character of pain. They were a long, long time alone. A soft tap at the door at length announced that someone was without. Oliver opened it, glided away, and gave place to Harry Maylie. "'I know it all,' he said, taking a seat beside the lovely girl. "'Dear Rose, I know it all. I am not here by accident,' he added, after a lengthened silence. "'Nor have I heard all this to-night, for I knew it yesterday, only yesterday. Do you guess that I have come to remind you of a promise?' "'Stay,' said Rose. "'You do know all?' "'All.' You gave me leave at any time within a year to renew the subject of our last discourse. I did. Not to press you to alter your determination, pursued the young man, but to hear you repeat it, if you would. I was to lay whatever of station or fortune I might possess at your feet, and if you still adhered to your former determination, I pledged myself by no word or act to seek to change it. "'The same reasons which influenced me then will influence me now,' said Rose firmly. "'If I ever owed a strict and rigid duty to her, whose goodness saved me from a life of indigence and suffering, when should I ever feel it as I should to-night?' "'It is a struggle,' said Rose, "'but one I am proud to make. It is a pang, but one my heart shall bear.' "'The disclosure of to-night?' Harry began. "'The disclosure of to-night,' replied Rose softly, "'leaves me in the same position, with reference to you, as that in which I stood before.' "'You harden your heart against me, Rose?' urged her lover. "'Oh, Harry! Harry!' said the young lady, bursting into tears. "'I wish I could, and spare myself this pain.' "'Then why inflict it on yourself?' said Harry, taking her hand. "'Think, dear Rose, think what you have heard to-night. "'And what I have heard! What have I heard?' cried Rose. "'That a sense of his deep disgrace, so worked upon my own father, that he shunned all. "'There, we have said enough, Harry, we have said enough.' "'Not yet, not yet,' said the young man, detaining her as she rose. My hopes, my wishes, prospects, feeling, every thought in life except my love for you, have undergone a change. I offer you now no distinction among a bustling crowd, no mingling with a world of malice and detraction, where the blood is called into honest cheeks by aught but real disgrace and shame, but a home, a heart and home. Yes, dearest Rose. And those, and those alone, are all I have to offer. "'What do you mean?' she faltered. "'I mean but this, that when I left you last, I left you with the firm determination to level all fancied barriers between yourself and me, resolved that if my world could not be yours, I would make yours mine, that no pride of birth should curl the lip at you, for I would turn from it. This I have done. 
those who have shrunk from me because of this, have shrunk from you, and proved you so far right. Such power and patronage, such relatives of influence and rank, as smiled upon me then, look coldly now. But there are smiling fields and waving trees in England's richest county, and by one village church, mine, Rose, my own, there stands a rustic dwelling which you can make me prouder of than all the hopes I have renounced, measured a thousandfold. This is my rank and station now, and here I lay it down. "'It's a trying thing, waiting supper for lovers,' said Mr. Grimwig, waking up and pulling his pocket-handkerchief from over his head. Truth to tell, the supper had been waiting a most unreasonable time. Neither Mrs. Maylie, nor Harry, nor Rose, who all came in together, could offer a word in extenuation. "'I had serious thoughts of eating my head to-night,' said Mr. Grimwig, "'for I began to think I should get nothing else. I'll take the liberty, if you'll allow me, of saluting the bride that is to be.' Mr. Grimwig lost no time in carrying this notice into effect upon the blushing girl. And the example, being contagious, was followed both by the doctor and Mr. Brownlow. Some people affirm that Harry Maylie had been observed to set it, originally, in a dark room adjoining. But the best authorities consider this downright scandal, he being young and a clergyman. "'Oliver, my child,' said Mrs. Maylie, "'where have you been? And why do you look so sad? There are tears stealing down your face at this moment. What is the matter?' "'It is a world of disappointment, often to the hopes we most cherish.' and hopes that do our nature the greatest honour. Poor Dick was dead. End of chapter 51《Chapter 52 of Oliver Twist》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Fifty Two. Fagin's Last Night Alive. The court was paved from floor to roof with human faces. Inquisitive and eager eyes peered from every inch of space. From the rail before the dock, away into the sharpest angle of the smallest corner in the galleries, all looks were fixed upon one man, Fagin. Before him and behind. Above, below, on the right and on the left, he seemed to stand surrounded by a firmament, all bright with gleaming eyes. He stood there, in all this glare of living light, with one hand resting on the wooden slab before him, the other held to his ear, and his head thrust forward to enable him to catch with greater distinctness every word that fell from the presiding judge, who was delivering his charge to the jury. At times he turned his eyes sharply upon them to observe the effect of the slightest featherweight in his favour, and when the points against him were stated with terrible distinctness, looked towards his counsel in mute appeal that he would even then urge something in his behalf. Beyond these manifestations of anxiety he stirred not hand or foot. He had scarcely moved since the trial began, and now that the judge ceased to speak, he still remained in the same strained attitude of close attention, with his gaze bent on him, as though he listened still. A slight bustle in the court recalled him to himself. Looking round, he saw that the jurymen had turned together to consider their verdict. As his eyes wandered to the gallery, he could see the people rising above each other to see his face, some hastily applying their glasses to their eyes and others whispering their neighbours with looks expressive of abhorrence. A few there were, who seemed unmindful of him, and looked only to the jury in impatient wonder how they could delay. But in no one face, not even among the women of whom there were many there, could he read the faintest sympathy with himself, or any feeling but one of all absorbing interest that he should be condemned. As he saw all this in one bewildered glance, the death-like stillness came again, and looking back he saw that the jurymen had turned towards the judge. Hush! They only sought permission to retire. He looked wistfully into their faces, one by one when they passed out, as though to see which way the greater number lent, 
but that was fruitless. The jailer touched him on the shoulder. He followed mechanically to the end of the dock, and sat down on a chair. The man pointed it out, or he would not have seen it. He looked up into the gallery again. Some of the people were eating, and some fanning themselves with handkerchiefs, for the crowded place was very hot. There was one young man sketching his face in a little notebook. He wondered whether it was like, and looked on when the artist broke his pencil point, and made another with his knife, as any idle spectator might have done. In the same way, when he turned his eyes towards the judge, his mind began to busy itself with the fashion of his dress, and what it cost, and how he put it on. There was an old fat gentleman on the bench, too, who had gone out some half an hour before, and now come back. He wondered within himself whether this man had been to get his dinner, what he had had, and where he had had it, and pursued this train of careless thought until some new object caught his eye, and roused another. Not that, all this time, his mind was, for an instant, free from one oppressive, overwhelming sense of the grave that opened at his feet. It was ever present to him, but in a vague and general way, and he could not fix his thoughts upon it. Thus even while he trembled, and turned burning hot at the idea of speedy death, he fell to counting the iron spikes before him, and wondering how the head of one had been broken off, and whether they would mend it, or leave it as it was. Then he thought of all the horrors of the gallows and the scaffold, and stopped to watch a man sprinkling the floor to cool it, and then went on to think again. At length there was a cry of silence, and a breathless look from all towards the door. The jury returned, and passed him close. He could glean nothing from their faces. They might as well have been of stone. Perfect stillness ensued. Not a rustle. Not a breath. Guilty. The building rang with a tremendous shout, and another, and another, and then it echoed loud groans that gathered strength as they swelled out like angry thunder. It was a peal of joy from the populace outside, greeting the news that he would die on Monday. The noise subsided, and he was asked if he had anything to say why sentence of death should not be passed upon him. He had resumed his listening attitude, and looked intently at his questioner while the demand was made, but it was twice repeated before he seemed to hear it, and then he only muttered that he was an old man, an old man, and so, dropping into a whisper, was silent again. The judge assumed the black cap, and the prisoner still stood with the same air and gesture. A woman in the gallery uttered some exclamation, called forth by this dread solemnity. He looked hastily up, as if angry at the interruption and bent forward yet more attentively. The address was solemn and impressive, the sentence fearful to hear, but he stood like a marble figure without the motion of a nerve. His haggard face was still thrust forward, his under jaw hanging down, and his eyes staring out before him, when the jailer put his hand upon his arm and beckoned him away. He gazed stupidly about him for an instant, and obeyed. They led him through a paved room under the court, where some prisoners were waiting till their turns came, and others were talking to their friends, who crowded round a grate which looked into the open yard. There was nobody there to speak to him. But, as he passed, the prisoners fell back to render him more visible to the people who were clinging to the bars, and they assailed him with opprobrious names, and screeched and hissed. He shook his fist, and would have spat upon them but his conductors hurried him on, through a gloomy passage lighted by a few dim lamps, into the interior of the prison. Here he was searched, that he might not have about him the means of anticipating the law. This ceremony performed, they led him to one of the condemned cells, and left him there, alone. He sat down on a stone bench opposite the door, which served for seat and bedstead, and casting his bloodshot eyes upon the ground, tried to collect his thoughts. After a while, he began to remember a few disjointed fragments of what the judge had said, though it had seemed to him at the time that he could not hear a word. These gradually fell into their proper places, and by degrees suggested more, so that in a little while he had the whole almost as it was delivered. To be hanged by the neck till he was dead. That was the end. To be hanged by the neck till he was dead. 
as it came on very dark, he began to think of all the men he had known who had died upon the scaffold, some of them through his means. They rose up, in such quick succession, that he could hardly count them. He had seen some of them die, and had joked, too, because they died with prayers upon their lips. With what a rattling noise the drop went down, and how suddenly they changed from strong and vigorous men to dangling heaps of clothes. Some of them might have inhabited that very cell, sat upon that very spot. It was very dark. Why didn't they bring a light? The cell had been built for many years. Scores of men must have passed their last hours there. It was like sitting in a vault strewn with dead bodies. The cap, the noose, the pinioned arms, the faces as he knew, even beneath that hideous veil. Light! Light! At length, when his hands were raw with beating against the heavy door and walls, two men appeared, one bearing a candle, which he thrust into an iron candlestick fixed against the wall, the other dragging in a mattress on which to pass the night, for the prisoner was to be left alone no more. Then came the night, dark, dismal, silent night. Other watchers are glad to hear this church clock strike, for they tell of life and coming day. To him they brought despair. The boom of every iron bell came laden with the one deep hollow sound, death. What availed the noise and bustle of cheerful morning, which penetrated even there to him? It was another form of knell, with mockery added to the warning. The day passed off. Day? There was no day. It was gone as soon as come, and night came on again. Night so long and yet so short, long in its dreadful silence, and short in its fleeting hours. At one time he raved and blasphemed, and at another howled and tore his hair. Venerable men of his own persuasion had come to pray beside him, but he had driven them away with curses. They renewed their charitable efforts, and he beat them off. Saturday night. He had only one night more to live, and as he thought of this, the day broke. Sunday. It was not until the night of this last awful day, that a withering sense of his helpless, desperate state came into its full intensity upon his blighted soul. Not that he had ever held any defined or positive hope of mercy, but that he had never been able to consider more than the dim probability of dying so soon. He had spoken little to either of the two men, who relieved each other in their attendance upon him, and they, for their parts, made no effort to rouse his attention. He had sat there, awake but dreaming. Now he started up every minute, and with gasping mouth and burning skin, hurried to and fro in such a paroxysm of fear and wrath, that even they, used to such sights, recoiled from him with horror. He grew so terrible at last, in all the tortures of his evil conscience, that one man could not bear to sit there eyeing him alone, and so the two kept watch together. He cowered down upon his stone bed, and thought of the past. He had been wounded with some missiles from the crowd on the day of his capture, and his head was bandaged with a linen cloth. His red hair hung down upon his bloodless face. His beard was torn, and twisted into knots. His eyes shone with a terrible light. His unwashed flesh crackled with the fever that burnt him up. Eight nine, ten. If it was not a trick to frighten him, and those of the real hours treading on each other's heels, where would he be when they came round again? Eleven? Another struck, before the voice of the previous hour had ceased to vibrate. At eight he would be the only mourner in his own funeral train. At eleven. Those dreadful walls of Newgate, which have hidden so much misery and such unspeakable anguish, not only from the eyes, but too often and too long, from the thoughts of men, never held so dread a spectacle as that. The few who lingered as they passed, and wondered what the man was doing who was to be hanged to-morrow, would have slept but ill that night if they could have seen him. From early in the evening until nearly midnight, little groups of two and three presented themselves at the lodge gate, and inquired with anxious faces whether any reprieve had been received these being answered in the negative, communicated the welcome intelligence to the clusters in the street, who pointed out to one another the door from which he must come out, and showed where the scaffold would be built, 
and, walking with unwilling steps away, turned back to conjure up the scene. By degrees they fell off, one by one, and, for an hour, in the dead of night, the street was left to solitude and darkness. The space before the prison was cleared, and a few strong barriers, painted black, had been already thrown across the road to break the pressure of the expected crowd, when Mr. Brownlow and Oliver appeared at the wicket, and presented an order of admission to the prisoner, signed by one of the sheriffs. They were immediately admitted into the lodge. "'Is the young gentleman to come too, sir?' said the man whose duty it was to conduct them. "'It's not a sight for children, sir.' "'It is not indeed, my friend,' rejoined Mr. Brownlow, "'but my business with this man is intimately connected with him, and as this child has seen him in the full career of his success and villainy, I think it as well, even at the cost of some pain and fear, that he should see him now.' These few words had been said apart, so as to be inaudible to Oliver. The man touched his hat and glancing at Oliver with some curiosity, opened another gate, opposite to that by which they had entered, and led them on through dark and winding ways towards the cells. "'This,' said the man, stopping in a gloomy passage, where a couple of workmen were making some preparations in profound silence, "'this is the place he passes through. If you step this way, you can see the door he goes out at.' He led them into a stone kitchen fitted with coppers for dressing the prison food, and pointed to a door. There was an open grating above it, through which came the sound of men's voices, mingled with the noise of hammering, and the throwing down of boards. They were putting up the scaffold. From this place they passed through several strong gates, opened by other turnkeys from the inner side, and, having entered an open yard, ascended a flight of narrow steps and came into a passage with a row of strong doors on the left hand. Motioning them to remain where they were, the turnkey knocked at one of these with his bunch of keys. The two attendants, after a little whispering, came out into the passage, stretching themselves as if glad of the temporary relief, and motioned the visitors to follow the jailer into the cell. They did so. The condemned criminal was seated on his bed, rocking himself from side to side, with a countenance more like that of a snared beast than the face of a man. His mind was evidently wandering to his old life, for he continued to mutter, without appearing conscious of their presence otherwise than as a part of his vision. "'Good boy, Charlie. Well done,' he mumbled. "'Oliver, too. <laughs> Oliver, too. Quite the gentleman now. Quite the—' "'Take that boy away to bed.' The jailer took the disengaged hand of Oliver, and, whispering him not to be alarmed, looked on without speaking. "'Take him away to bed!' cried Fagin. "'Do you hear me, some of you? He has been the—the—somehow the cause of all this. It's worth the money to bring him up to it. Bolt her throat, Bill. Never mind the girl. Bolt her throat as deep as you can cut. Saw his head off. Fagin, said the jailer. That's me, cried the Jew, falling instantly into the attitude of listening he had assumed upon his trial. An old man, my lord. A very old, old man. Here, said the turnkey laying his hand upon his breast to keep him down. "'Here's somebody wants to see you, to ask you some questions, I suppose. Fagin? Fagin? Are you a man?' "'I shan't be one long,' he replied, looking up with a face retaining no human expression but rage and terror. "'Strike them all dead! What right have they to butcher me?' As he spoke, he caught sight of Oliver and Mr. Brownlow. Shrinking to the farthest corner of the seat, he demanded to know what they wanted there. "'Steady,' said the turnkey, still holding him down. "'Now, sir, tell him what you want. Quick, if you please, for he grows worse as the time gets on.' "'You have some papers,' said Mr. Brownlow, advancing, "'which were placed in your hands, for better security, by a man called Monks.' "'It's all a lie together.' replied Fagin, 
I haven't one. Not one. For the love of God, said Mr. Brownlow solemnly, do not say that now, upon the very verge of death, but tell me where they are. You know that Sykes is dead, that Monks has confessed, that there is no hope of any further gain. Where are those papers? Oliver, cried Fagin, beckoning to him. Here, here, let me whisper to you. I am not afraid, said Oliver, in a low voice, as he relinquished Mr. Brownlow's hand. The papers, said Fagin, drawing Oliver towards him, are in a canvas bag, in a hole a little way up the chimney, in the top front room. I want to talk to you, my dear. I want to talk to you. Yes, yes, returned Oliver. Let me say a prayer. Do. Let me say one prayer. Say only one. Upon your knees with me, and we will talk till morning. Outside. Outside, replied Fagin, pushing the boy before him towards the door, and looking vacantly over his head. "'Say I've gone to sleep. They'll believe you. You can get me out, if you take me so. Now then, now then—' "'Oh, God forgive this wretched man!' cried the boy, with a burst of tears. "'That's right, that's right,' said Fagin. "'That'll help us on. This door first, if I shake and tremble as we pass the gallows, don't you mind, but hurry on, now, now, now. Have you nothing else to ask of him, sir? inquired the turnkey. No other question, replied Mr. Brownlow. If I hoped we could recall him to a sense of his position. Nothing will do that, sir, replied the man, shaking his head. You'd better leave him. The door of the cell opened and the attendants returned. "'Press on! Press on!' cried Fagin. "'Softly, but not so slow! Faster! Faster!' The men laid hands upon him, and, disengaging Oliver from his grasp, held him back. He struggled with the power of desperation, for an instant, and then sent up cry upon cry that penetrated even those massive walls, and rang in their ears until they reached the open yard. It was some time before they left the prison. Oliver nearly swooned after this frightful scene, and was so weak that, for an hour or more, he had not the strength to walk. Day was dawning when they again emerged. A great multitude had already assembled. The windows were filled with people, smoking and playing cards, to beguile the time. The crowd were pushing, quarrelling, joking. Everything told of life and animation but one dark cluster of objects in the centre of all—the black stage, the cross-beam, the rope, and all the hideous apparatus of death. End of chapter 52《Oliver Twist》by Charles Dickens Chapter 53 And Last The fortunes of those who have figured in this tale are nearly closed. The little that remains to their historian to relate is told in few and simple words. Before three months had passed, Rose Fleming and Harry Maylie were married in the village church, which was henceforth to be the scene of the young clergyman's labours. On the same day, they entered into possession of their new and happy home. Mrs. Maylie took up her abode with her son and daughter-in-law, to enjoy, during the tranquil remainder of her days, the greatest felicity that age and worth can know, the contemplation of the happiness of those on whom the warmest affections and tenderest cares of a well-spent life have been unceasingly bestowed. It appeared, on full and careful investigation, that if the wreck of property remaining in the custody of monks, which had never prospered either in his hands or in those of his mother, were equally divided between himself and Oliver, it would yield to each little more than three thousand pounds. 
by the provisions of his father's will, Oliver would have been entitled to the whole, but Mr. Brownlow, unwilling to deprive the elder son of the opportunity of retrieving his former vices and pursuing an honest career, proposed this mode of distribution, to which his young charge joyfully acceded. Monks, still bearing that assumed name, retired with his portion to a distant part of the new world, where, having quickly squandered it, he once more fell into his old courses, and, after undergoing a long confinement for some fresh act of fraud and knavery, at length sunk under an attack of his old disorder, and died in prison. As far from home, died the chief remaining members of his friend Fagin's gang. Mr. Brownlow adopted Oliver as his son, removing with him and the old housekeeper to within a mile of the parsonage house, where his dear friends resided. He gratified the only remaining wish of Oliver's warm and earnest heart, and thus linked together a little society, whose condition approached as nearly to one of perfect happiness as can ever be known in this changing world. Soon after the marriage of the young people, the worthy doctor returned to Chertsey, where, bereft of the presence of his old friends, he would have been discontented, if his temperament had admitted of such a feeling, and would have turned quite peevish if he had known how. For two or three months he contented himself with hinting that he feared the air began to disagree with him. Then, finding that the place really no longer was to him what it had been, he settled his business on his assistant, took a bachelor's cottage outside the village of which his young friend was pastor, and instantaneously recovered. Here he took to gardening, planting, fishing, carpentering, and various other pursuits of a similar kind, all undertaken with his characteristic impetuosity. In each and all he has since become famous throughout the neighbourhood as a most profound authority. Before his removal, he had managed to contract a strong friendship for Mr. Grimwig, which that eccentric gentleman cordially reciprocated. He is accordingly visited by Mr. Grimwig a great many times in the course of the year. On all such occasions, Mr. Grimwig plants, fishes, and carpenters with great ardour, doing everything in a very singular and unprecedented manner, but always maintaining, with his favourite asseveration, that his mode is the right one. On Sundays, he never fails to criticise the sermon to the young clergyman's face, always informing Mr. Losburn, in strict confidence afterwards, that he considered it an excellent performance, but deems it as well not to say so. It is a standing and very favourite joke, for Mr. Brownlow to rally him on his old prophecy concerning Oliver, and to remind him of the night on which they sat with the watch between them, waiting his return but Mr. Grimwig contends that he was right in the main, and, in proof thereof, remarks that Oliver did not come back after all, which always calls forth a laugh on his side, and increases his good humour. Mr. Noah Claypole, receiving a free pardon from the Crown, in consequence of being admitted a prover against Fagin, and considering his profession not altogether as safe a one as he could wish, was for some little time at a loss for the means of a livelihood, not burdened with too much work. After some consideration, he went into business as an informer, in which calling he realises a genteel subsistence. His plan is to walk out once a week during church time, attended by Charlotte, in respectable attire. The lady faints away at the doors of charitable publicans, and the gentleman, being accommodated with threepenny worth of brandy to restore her, lays an information next day, and pockets half the penalty. Sometimes Mr. Claypole faints himself, but the result is the same. Mr. and Mrs. Bumble, deprived of their situations, were gradually reduced to great indigence and misery, and finally became paupers in that very same workhouse in which they had once lauded it over others. Mr. Bumble has been heard to say that in this reverse and degradation, he has not even spirits to be thankful for being separated from his wife. As to Mr. Giles and Brittles, they still remain in their old posts, although the former is bald, and the last-named boy quite grey. They sleep at the parsonage, but divide their attention so equally among its inmates, and Oliver and Mr. Brownlow, and Mr. Losburn, that to this day the villagers have never been able to discover to which establishment they properly belong. Master Charles Bates, appalled by Sykes's crime, 
fell into a train of reflection whether an honest life was not, after all, the best. Arriving at the conclusion that it certainly was, he turned his back upon the scenes of the past, resolved to amend it in some new sphere of action. He struggled hard, and suffered much for some time. But, having a contented disposition, and a good purpose, succeeded in the end, and, from being a farmer's drudge, and a carrier's lad, he is now the merriest young grazier in all Northamptonshire. And now the hand that traces these words falters, as it approaches the conclusion of its task, and would weave for a little longer space the thread of these adventures. I would fain linger yet with a few of those among whom I have so long moved, and shared their happiness by endeavouring to depict it. I would show Rose Maylie in all the bloom and grace of early womanhood, shedding on her secluded path in life soft and gentle light that fell on all who trod it with her, and shone into their hearts. I would paint her the life and joy of the fireside circle, and the lively summer group. I would follow her through the sultry fields at noon, and hear the low tones of her sweet voice in the moonlit evening walk. I would watch her in all her goodness and charity abroad, and the smiling, untiring discharge of domestic duties at home. I would paint her and her dead sister's child happy in their love for one another, and passing whole hours together in picturing the friends whom they had so sadly lost. I would summon before me, once again, those joyous little faces that clustered round her knee, and listen to their merry prattle. I would recall the tones of that clear laugh, and conjure up the sympathising tear that glistened in the soft blue eye. These and a thousand looks and smiles, and turns of thought and speech, I would fain recall them, every one. How Mr. Brownlow went on, from day to day, filling the mind of his adopted child with stores of knowledge, and becoming attached to him, more and more, as his nature developed itself, and showed the thriving seeds of all he wished him to become. How he traced in him new traits of his early friend, that awakened in his own bosom old remembrances, melancholy and yet sweet and soothing, how the two orphans, tried by adversity, remembered its lessons in mercy to others, and mutual love, and fervent thanks to him who had protected and preserved them, these are all matters which need not to be told. I have said that they were truly happy, and without strong affection and humanity of heart, and gratitude to that being whose code is mercy, and whose great attribute is benevolence, to all things that breathe, happiness can never be attained. Within the altar of the old village church there stands a white marble tablet, which bears as yet but one word, Agnes. There is no coffin in that tomb, and may it be many, many years before another name is placed above it. But if the spirits of the dead ever come back to earth, to visit spots hallowed by the love, the love beyond the grave, of those whom they knew in life. I believe that the shade of Agnes sometimes hovers round that solemn nook. I believe it none the less, because that nook is in a church, and she was weak and erring. End of chapter 53 Recorded by Mill Nicholson Web address act2sc3.com End of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens.